So um, first of all, I'd just like to um, thank Rod very much for asking me to um, provide a lecture today. And it's, a, it's a, a great program that they've put together, particularly with the international speakers, Gary Taubes and David Unwin. So it's really quite exciting to meet those people. And I've followed them for a number of years now on, on different um, media sources, you know, Twitter and those sorts of things. So I'm really excited to meet those. And thanks again to Rod for asking me to speak. I feel like I'm um, playing to my forehand a little bit because I'm a radiologist and I'm speaking about radiology. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, we, I, I, we, I got talking to Rod about um, what I could talk about. And one of the things that seems to come up a little bit is the coronary artery calcium score. And for those of you who follow Ivor Cummins, uh, he, he talks about this, this topic a lot in terms of risk. Um, and there's often a little bit of uh, misconceptions about the coronary artery calcium score. So I thought that I could maybe um, just talk about what we actually look at on a coronary artery calcium score and in fact what it means. So I'm going to go over a, a number of topics with you today. I'll, we'll have a look at coronary artery anatomy. Um, we'll have a look at the plaque. So the, the disease that we're, we're looking at is the atheromatous plaques that can build up inside our arteries and inside the coronary arteries in particular. We'll look at what a coronary artery calcium score is. So what is it, where is it useful, but what are its limitations? We'll look at risks and costs um, of a coronary artery calcium score. Um, and then just because I, to explain the coronary artery calcium score, I want to talk about some of the other imaging that we can use, in particular the coronary artery uh, angiogram and also a, a formal uh, uh, catheter angiogram. I'm going to talk about what angina is and what an acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack is, just so I can t explain why we would use different tests in different circumstances. So before we sort of get started, again, it's not, I'm not going to provide with individual medical advice. Um, and, and my um, thoughts on any sort of imaging test or any test in particular is I sort of follow the choosing widely type guidelines that are produced from Australia. So, before you embark on any test or treatment, you know, you should have a conversation with your treating health practitioner. You know, is the test needed? What are the risks? What are the benefits and what are the costs of that um, test or treatment? And, but hopefully I'm going to be able to provide you with a little bit of information on, on those topics. So let's move to the anatomy. For, so um, anatomy is pretty straightforward actually. Um, there can be vari variations obviously between patients, but there's two coronary arteries. So sometimes radiologists joke about this and say, you know, it's not that hard for us. There's two, two arteries and one disease. Um, in terms of some of the other imaging we look at, that's just to mock our cardiology colleagues. But um, there's the right coronary artery and the left main coronary artery. Uh, and then the left main coronary artery actually divides into the left anterior descending and the left circumflex. So there are sort of three main arteries, but there's actually just two arteries that arise from the aorta to supply the heart. The coronary arteries are considered to be end arteries. Um, now what that means is if you block that artery off, um, the part of the heart that's supplied by that artery will, will, be, um, uh, will die or will be damaged because of, that, because of that blockage. So in some parts of the body you can block an artery and another artery will sort of open up to supply that part of the, the body and you don't get the damage. But the coronary arteries are considered to be end arteries. Now, we do actually have the potential to open up what's called a collateral circulation and actually open up another vessel, but that's a process that takes some time. And so if you get an acute blockage, then um, that part of the heart that's supplied by that coronary artery will be damaged. What is coronary artery calcium? So the disease that we're trying to image with the coronary arteries is the atherosclerotic plaque and calcification occurs within those plaques, both at an early stage, but also in, in the late stages when the plaques can actually be stabilising. Um, it doesn't occur in normal vessels. So if we see calcium within a vessel, then that's an abnormal finding. And it tells us that um, there's some atheroma in that coronary artery. And you can have atheromatous buildup in the coronary arteries without any symptoms. So symptoms will only arise when the plaque is narrowing a vessel to the point where flow is being impacted and you've got some flow limitations. So you can have quite extensive coronary artery disease or these atheromatous plaques um, without having any symptoms. And that's why um, 
you know, sometimes imaging can help us um, to, to have a look at where, where your status is at. And so I've tried to sort of use this slide to try and explain the processes that we're going to be talking about, and I've got some road signs for you. So coronary artery disease, and I've got the exclamation mark, is essentially that just gives you an idea of risk. So the extent of coronary artery disease you have, so the more atheromatous plaques you have within your coronary arteries, the more likely one of them could rupture and block a vessel. And so um, with a coronary artery calcium score, what we're looking at is the extent of disease and trying to get an idea of risk. Angina is when you have a narrowing of the vessel. And so stable angina would be in a person who they might at rest, they don't have any chest pain, but say with exercise, they get some chest pain. And then when they rest again, that chest pain goes away. That's called angina or stable angina. And that means there's a narrowing, okay? Um, and then a heart attack occurs if that um, plaque is damaged and tears and the sort of surface layer of that plaque tears and a clot forms on it and blocks off the vessel and there's no flow in the distal vessel then that's a heart attack. So I've sort of, the road signs we're sort of using are the explanation mark, a road narrowing sign, and then a stop sign. The plaque that we're um, talking about, I've got, if you have a look on the slide there, I've got, this is a histology slide now, where we've taken a coronary artery, we've put a cut through it, and then put it onto a microscopic slide. And that's what a normal vessel looks like, that pink vessel um, on my left, on your left as well. Whereas the middle slide there is what a plaque looks like. We get a buildup of <laughs> lipid um, and inflammation essentially within the wall of the vessel. And sometimes that only has a very thin layer that's protecting it. And if that layer tears, it exposes the um, wall to the blood supply and that's when a clot can form and, and result in a heart attack. And the slide I've got on the right is to try and represent what we might see on a coronary artery calcium score. So, we, we can see the wall, we can sort of see the wall looks a bit grey and we'll, we'll see like a white spot, which is a calcium deposit. And what that actually looks like on a um, coronary artery calcium score CT is like that. We've, I've labelled the vessels there. So the right coronary artery is the RCA, the LAD and the LCX. So that's what, a, that's what the imaging would look like um, when we're assessing someone's coronary artery calcium score. Now, just to preview this, so when we're talking about coronary artery calcium score, we're really talking about asymptomatic people. So if people have symptoms of chest pain or angina or we're worried, then we wouldn't do a calcium score. This is a, it's a test that we use for patients who are asymptomatic um, to try and give us an idea of their cardiovascular risk. Um, and this is not based on any, I don't have any randomized controlled trials to show you, you know, that this gives you benefit. Um, but I'm sort of going off the position statement put together by the Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand. So let's have a look at how cardiovascular risk is assessed now. So this is, this is online. You can go um, into this online and you can plug it, and your GP would likely do this, and you can plug in your details, you know, your age, your sex, whether you're a smoker, um, your total cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol, whether you have diabetes, and that will give you uh, an idea of your cardiovascular risk. But there's a few things that are weak in this assessment in that there's no family history. It probably tends to overestimate risk in the contemporary population and it is based on historical data. But out of that, um, it'll, it'll put you into one of these risk categories. So high risk, moderate risk, or um, low risk. And then the treatment may be based on, on this risk assessment. The other thing with this calculator is that um, as you get older, your risk will just automatically go up. So it, uh, that's as part of the calculations, the older you get, the higher your risk, so your risk is going to score higher. So it's quite possible that you can get put into a risk category which is actually not your correct category, just based on this risk. And that's really where the coronary artery calcium score comes in. Because what it does is it actually looks at your vessels and tells you whether you actually have this process, this atheromatous plaque going on in your coronary arteries. It's a surrogate measure for your total burden of coronary artery disease. So there's some important words there. I'm saying it's a surrogate because 
One of the criticisms you'll see people say is, well, it doesn't detect non-calcified plaque because we see both calcified and non-calcified plaque. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's okay. This is really just a measurement of the overall burden. It's a surrogate measure and it's a very good surrogate measure. It seems to be very accurate in terms of the assessment of your overall coronary artery disease. It doesn't tell us anything about obstruction. So we can't diagnose whether a vessel is obstructed or partially obstructed on the basis of a coronary artery calcium score. We have to do another test for that. It just gives us an assessment of your overall burden of disease. And from that, we can give an idea of you as a specific individual's cardiovascular risk going forward. And it's important, and I've said this before, that you can actually have quite an extensive plaque burden, but if it's not causing any narrowing, um, you, there'll be no symptoms, so it can be silent and yet you can still have a significant burden of coronary artery disease. So what does it look like? Well, I've already shown this slide. This is what the scan would look like to the radiologist when it comes through. And I've got a little diagram there showing you that sort of grey wall and a couple of specks of calcium. And then what we do is, knowing the sort of anatomy of the vessels, we will label those vessels and um, we'll just sort of pick on each bit of calcium and essentially it comes up a different colour and there's a computer program that does that for us. Um, and we just sort of direct where the... You see all of the pink bit is actually calcium, so you can see it in the ribs and in the spine at the back there. But we've selected out the coronary arteries to, to be labelled and then that um, will then give us a score. Now, if there's no coronary artery calcium at all, then that um, it makes obstructive coronary artery disease very unlikely, but it's not impossible because there still could be a non-calcified plaque that we can't see. At the end of that scan, you'll get a score, and this is what the score would look like. So each of the vessels will have, you know, how many plaques we detected. So in this case, you know, there was 27 plaques, um, and the score would be 721, which is quite a high score. Um, and then you'd get plotted on a graph in terms of age match controls where your score would, would um, fit compared to essentially the population at large. And it gives you an idea about risk. It's a superior predictor of risk than the risk calculator I showed you before. So if you have a look at this slide, you can see a graph of the different things that can increase risk, diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, family history, etc. But the coronary artery calcium score, as, as the score goes up, your risk and your relative risk ratio, so how likely you are to have a coronary event, goes up and it's a pretty um, strong and linear relationship with an increasing score. What about if you get a zero? So people are always um, very excited when they get a zero, as they should be. Um, it's pretty much, you've got a 10 year warranty, um, which is great. You, your your event risk is less than 1% if you get a zero score. Um, and so um, it, it's a very powerful test showing you're, you've got a low cardiovascular risk if you get a zero score and we can't detect any coronary artery calcium uh, in, 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 your, um, in the coronary arteries. Um, so how useful is that? Like what, what point does that have? Well, and I've spoken to my cardiology con colleagues on this topic and they say, you know, they found it very useful because it certainly... Um, when people can see um, the calcium or the damage to their coronary arteries, then it's a very motivating force for them and often will be the extra bit they need perhaps to change or modify some lifestyle or behaviour or their diet to, um, to try and improve their health. Um, and also um, in terms of initiation, continuation of medications, it often helps people to, to motivate them on that as well. In clinical practice, it's often used in that moderate risk group, um, and it's to it, it's very useful in reclassifying, particularly that group. And that, this is from the position statement as well. You can be reclassified into higher or lower risk. Um, in lower risk patients who have any of the following: um, a strong family history, diabetes, or the indigenous population. Um, the traditional risk factors actually probably underestimates their risk and so they might be sort of classified as lower risk when actually they're higher risk and again a coronary artery calcium score can identify that higher risk. In terms of, this is a, bit, a busy slide a little bit so I'm going to skip on, but in terms of what percentage of people get reclassified, um, if you look at the, this intermediate risk group, 
Um, there was a large study that showed, you know, 24% got reclassified to high risk, 19 to lower risk, or around about 43% essentially changed their risk status on the basis of a coronary artery calcium score. Another study showed 55%. So in summary, around about 50% or half people who are on the classical risk factors are assessed as intermediate risk will get reclassified as either higher or lower risk on the basis of a coronary artery uh, calcium score. Um, what about repeat testing? Um, so current uh, recommendations are that we shouldn't repeat it um, in less than five years. Um, although there's certainly uh, some pretty good evidence that if you do repeat it within you know, a year or two and you're showing an increasing trend, then that's bad. It gives you an idea about increasing risk. But if you have a stable um, coronary artery calcium, then that's a very good sign that you've essentially stabilised the disease. And those plaques do go through phases. So they go through a vulnerable phase where they're at risk of rupturing and then they actually do stabilise and sometimes that more dense calcification is actually a stable plaque rather than one that's at risk. But that is something that's very difficult for us to um, assess on imaging. Uh, although there have been some sort of more novel techniques looking at that, but nothing is really established in terms of assessment of the vulnerable plaque. What about radiation? So everyone always worries about sort of radiation because we've got to talk about, well, what are the risks of this procedure? So the dose, particularly on a modern scanner, is very low. So um, uh, at w the scanners that uh, I work on, we can do this for around about 0.3 of a millisievert. Um, but probably most scanners, it sits around about half a millisievert. Now, I know, what does that mean? The annual background radiation in Australia um, is 1.5 millisieverts. So what you're talking about is a dose for an imaging test, it's equivalent to about four months of background radiation supply. So you're exposed um, to that all the time. And I asked the medical physicists at the institution I work at, you know, could they give me an idea about, well, what's, what does that mean? in terms of increased cancer risk. And they, it's, it's very difficult, in fact. They said, look, we would say that it's negligible. Um, we would say that the increased risk is we estimate at one in 100,000, um, but that's probably an overestimate. So the risk of you know, getting a, a ra this radiation dose causing injury is actually very, very small. And to put that in context, you know, one in 100,000 risk, um, the background risk of you know, some of the cancers that we see in the community, for example, breast cancer is one in eight in women, um, melanoma is one in 13. So just to put in context of where that one in 100,000 would fit in, it's, it's very tiny uh, in terms of increased risk. What are the other risks um, of a calcium score? So I guess it could falsely um, provoke anxiety in people, like they could you know, see that they've got some calcium there and you know become very worried about it and perhaps they weren't going to have an event anyway so that's always something I think before you embark on a test you need to think about. The other thing is that we do image part of the chest and the radiologist will look at the entire scan and we'll, we'll be looking for other things as well and we might see you know a little nodule in the lung and that little nodule in the lung may be nothing maybe just a little bit of inflammation a little bit of scarring but equally could be a, a small cancer and we can't often tell those two apart. Uh, and what that means is that um, we would mention that and often the patient would need to have ongoing scans over a number of years just to make sure that that little area that we saw was in fact nothing rather than something significant. And of course that can engender a lot of anxiety and I think that's important for people to understand that as well. And it can falsely reassure if you're unlucky enough to have no calcified, you had non-calcified plaques that we didn't see um, and you had a, a zero score. So they're the risk, but I think balanced, to, there's certainly some uh, significant potential benefits in terms of giving you an idea of your overall cardiac risk. The other thing to bear in mind is that the coronary artery calcium score is not covered by Medicare. And so that there would be a cost associated with having this test done. And in Australia, it's around about 100 to $150, depending on um, which of the, um, which were the radiology practices you went to. Just to talk about a little bit, I've talked about the coronary artery calcium score, but I want to talk about some of the other tests that you'll hear talked about, just so that you understand where they, they fit in. So coronary artery stenosis is when you have a narrowing of one of the coronary arteries, and that can produce angina or symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, pressure, etc. cetera. 
um, and if it's a stable, it'll be re you know, resolved with, um, with rest uh, or, or nitrates. Um, there are other things that can cause these symptoms, so musculoskeletal pain, esophageal reflux can also cause these symptoms. But if a patient had those sort of symptoms, we wouldn't be doing a coronary calcium score because the calcium score is just to look at risk. We'd be actually looking for a narrowing. And the couple of tests that we can do, we can do a CT coronary angiogram. So in this study, we've actually injected some iodine-based, essentially X-ray dye into the circulation, and that will make the vessels go white for us. And then when those vessels are white, we can actually look to see whether there's any narrowings within the vessels. And we'll be able to see both the calcified plaques, but also the non-calcified plaques. And we'll be able to see whether we think there's any significant narrowing of those coronary arteries. And sometimes patients can have extensive calcified coronary artery disease, as I said, but they don't actually have any narrowing or significant narrowing. And this is what a CT coronary angiogram would look like. Um, that's a vessel. You can see that there's white, no, that's the contrast material that's within the arterial circulation. Um, for acute coronary syndrome, so if the patient now presents essentially having a heart attack um, and you're worried about occlusion of the coronary artery, then there'll be some ECG changes that would tell us that. There'd be some blood marker changes that would tell us that we think the patient's having a heart attack. Uh, in that case, the patient would go on to have what's called a catheter angiogram, where a catheter is inserted usually by the femoral artery up into one of the coronary arteries and then uh, dye is uh, injected into the vessel uh, and it outlines the vessel. And this is what that would look like. So that's a catheter angiogram. Um, that's the right coronary artery that's been there. There's a, there's a bit of a narrowing. Um, so let's just talk about the differences between these two tests now and then we're, then we're finished with the talk. So what do we see on a CTCA and what do we see on a catheter angiogram and what are the differences between those two? So on the CTCA, the uh, CT coronary angiogram, we can see the wall of the vessel. We can see the calcium within the vessel. We usually do a coronary artery calcium score at the same time. So that'll give us an idea about risk. We can see if the vessel's narrowed. So you can see there, I've sort of put the white in there showing an area of narrowing. And we can see above the narrowing and below the narrowing. And with that, we can sort of reconstruct an image of the vessel that shows that narrowing. Okay, so it's a very good test. So what does a catheter angiogram do in, instead then? What's the difference between the two? So a catheter angiogram is the dye just within the lumen. It's essentially just looking at the lumen. We can't see the wall and assess the plaque. So you might think that's a disadvantage, but it has some significant advantages over CT as well. We get temporal information, so we get an idea. We inject the contrast and we can watch it flow, like that previous slide I showed you, and that can give us an idea about how significant the narrowing is within the vessel. It, the spatial resolution is much, much higher on the catheter angiogram than it is on the CT angiogram. So we're, we're better actually at assessing the degree of narrowing or stenosis on a catheter angiogram than we are on a CT angiogram. We also can put a probe across a narrowing and we can measure the pressure differential before and after the stenosis, again, giving us an idea about how significant the narrowing is. And um, in, in, in the correct clinical scenario, the interventional cardiologist can treat the narrowing by putting a, st a stent in, um, if that's the correct management. So that's the differences between the two tests. So with that, I'll bring it to an end. Uh, hopefully, people, the, the people have found that enjoyable. <laughs>